Hello again, and welcome to another 360 Timmy. So today we're at, uh, well, where are we? Romney Marsh, isn't it? Yeah, Romney Marsh. Romney yeah. Marsh in Kent. Um, I forgot where in Kent we are. So there you are. That's, a, <laughs> that's old age for you. My special guest today is Dominic King. Uh, welcome, Dom. Hello, Tim. Uh, this is a, a real pleasure for me because uh, I went to school with Dom and uh, I've been on his radio show many times over the years. I've, we've collaborated quite a bit. And this is the first time that I've actually got to, a chance to turn the tables and ask him a few questions. So Dom is a senior broadcaster at BBC Radio Kent. He's been involved in radio, I'd say, over the last five decades, because we think about you started in the late 1980s, didn't you? <laughs> that sounds so like it a is, long time. It is five decades, isn't it, technically? Oh, wow. Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, school was where it probably started. And uh, uh, I definitely had that bug even before you and I were at school together from the age of 11. I, I had a friend called Matthew Pullen who um, absolutely loved radio like me. We had, our, we had our little names for each other as well. Um, they're almost like CB handles at the time, I remember. Not like Smashy and Nicey then? Yeah, well, it was a little bit like that, but it was like, um, I think mine, I was called the Phantom Man, and I can't quite remember what his was, but um, we had those kind of we loved all the CB type stuff and uh, I suppose that was the first kind of communication for us. And uh, yeah, we'd then go down with our tape recorder and record things like the Donkey Derby in Folkestone and do little reports. And I remember on the cassette tape sort of recording what was going on there. So yeah, that was probably when the bug for just doing anything like reporting happened. But this all started initially with newsprint, did it? Yeah, Journalism. yeah. Um, when we went to school at uh, Brockhill and St. Leonard's as it was then, uh, I had a maths teacher who uh, was just fantastic. And she, um, she recognized when I was maybe writing within my exercise book that I didn't necessarily get maths. I didn't understand it, which is really ironic because in the world I work in now, maths is every part of it. But at the time, I did, just didn't understand maths. But what I did understand was writing. And she said that I'd written really well in my maths textbooks. So she had, I think it was her husband, who was a publisher um, of a young people's newspaper called The Early Times. And they were published at the time out of Brighton. And she said, uh, maybe you'd like to write for this paper. And it was as simple as that. And I remember her vividly bringing in, I think, a copy of the early times and putting it in front of me. And from that moment, I became part of this international group of young kids called the Press Gang. While that TV show was going on on ITV at the same time, Dexter by the Fletcher. way. Fletcher. That's right. And it Julius was... Sawala. Yeah, and the producer was a Doctor Who producer. Um, oh, yes. Um, was it uh, Chris Chubno? or uh, the um, one before that. Um, yeah, I know who you mean. Yeah. And, um, and uh, basically, um, I started writing for this young people's newspaper, and it took me all over the place and interviewing people. My first interview with, not far from here, actually, we're not far away from where he lives now and where his constituency was, the Folkestone and Hive MP, uh, Michael Howard, now Lord Howard, um, was one time Conservative leader. And I've bizarrely been interviewing him since I was 12 years of age and I still interview him now. Crikey. So I'm 48. <laughs> so a long relationship with him over the years. And uh, he was environment minister in Margaret Thatcher's government uh, when the Channel Tunnel was being built. And I, my first ever interview, because I lived in Cheriton near Folkestone, was asking him about the construction of the Channel Tunnel. And we have to remember back then, you know, there'd been a few accidents that had happened in the construction. A um, couple of construction workers, I think, had died. And it was kind of, you know, a really key part of the story of the rebuild, the Channel Tunnel coming to Kent. It certainly did cut through the countryside as well, didn't it, in terms of uh, construction? Yeah, and like in inevitably, like all these projects, you know, there's the people who are for it because it would change travel. I bizarrely had a situation where my dad, who was a cross-channel ferry worker, was a quartermaster, totally against the Channel Tunnel. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even go on the Channel Tunnel until he died, just because I was so worried about telling him that I'd gone on the Channel Tunnel to go over to France. <laughs> yeah, we don't bat an eyelid now, do we? I remember no. the no tunnel signs and everything. So that also led you to meet some famous people. So you had a infamous trip to New York. Yeah, that was uh, 
Hello. That was quite something. So in 1990, as part of working initially for this young people's newspaper, um, they wanted uh, a couple of kids to go over to the World Summit for Children in New York um, at the United Nations. This was huge, obviously. And, but, but to that point, I'm 15 now. I'd already been working for the early times for three years. And I had been writing articles and I'd interviewed, you know, people like Genesis, the band, and I'd interviewed all sorts of um, interesting people like Imran Khan and uh, things like that. So I, um, I ended up going to uh, New York to the World Summit for Children and it was part of a BBC TV programme. So it was a cross between the early times working with BBC TV and Michael Burke was presenting a programme called Nature on BBC Two. And part of that programme, which was all about the environment, was to look at the environmental side of this World Summit for children. So you've got to think of things like uh, what was happening on the streets of Brazil, what was happening with the Yanomami tribe in the middle of Brazil, um, in the rainforest and things like that. So that's what happened. And I found myself on the plane heading over to New York, 15 years of age, interviewing presidents and prime ministers, Rocky. um, goodwill ambassadors, celebrities being amazing, you know, people like Peter Ustinov and as I say, Imran Khan and people like that. And, uh, and also the ambassador for UNICEF, I believe. Yeah, that was a that was a strange one. So one of the one of the goodwill ambassadors there was Peter Ustinov, Julio Iglesias. Um, I want to go into singing there, Tim, um, <laughs> and Imran Khan. But the fourth one, I was interviewing all these people, and I, literally, Tim, I had a I had a cassette recorder that I was recording for myself on. I had a notepad and a pen and I was writing down stuff. And then I had the BBC film crew following me and the other press gangers. One of them um, was uh, Nakem on your door and Nakem I keep in touch with to this day. Um, the other one was an American called Monica Tarazi and the other kid who was 13, I think, uh, Stan Bright. So there were four press gangers, but it was Nakem and I who really, I guess, ended up being the face of the whole program because it was Nakem and I who did the pieces to camera. We had to go to Harlem to do a visual shot looking back at uh, the UN, things like that. And one of those interviews was with this ambassador, Goodwill Ambassador, and I walked into the middle of this room and there were a lot of people around her and I started asking questions. I was really kind of thrown in by the producer. I didn't really know who it was, to be honest with you. All I was told was she's an actress and she's very famous but ask her what you think. And they were very free and easy. They didn't guide us on any of the questions. They literally said, ask what you would want to ask. Well, in my brain, I was a journalist. You know, in my brain, I've been doing it for a, you know, a young age, like the Donkey Derby in Folkestone, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went up to her and all these film crews from the likes of CBS and NBC and newspapers like, USA Today, if you remember that, and yeah. New York Times. And I went up to this lady and she looked amazing. She was all in white. I remember her being completely dressed in white. And I said to her, if there was anything for children that you could do for the children of the world, what would it be? And she just said two words, create peace. That might sound not much of an answer, but actually when you think about it, it's a huge answer because saying that, hello, oh. saying that is all encompassing, isn't it? Yeah. I walked away from talking to her and the producer was pretty pleased. And I said to her, so who was that? And she said, oh, her name's Audrey Hepburn. She's a very famous actress. Just a bit. Years later, obviously, I completely understood the power of what that was, Tim, and the fact that actually she died in 1992. So two years earlier, I had one of the last interviews with her because she didn't do much after that. And in fact, on the day she died, the Sun newspaper printed my interview with her. Um, I think a news agency picked up on it. And the New York Times had said at the time, 
when I was out there, Audrey Hepburn, screen legend, is interviewed by Edward from Narnia. Uh, my God. <laughs> Edward from Narnia. Gotta, gotta, love a, gotta love a newspaper headline. Gotta wow. love a newspaper connection. I'm English. I must be from Narnia. But that is, that's quite something. And you, you've been trying to uh, bring that, you've got that on cassette, haven't you? Mm. You've been trying to bring that back to life. That, yeah, well, uh, bizarrely, years later, with AI, uh, I recently grabbed hold of that cassette tape because of the changes in AI of cleaning things up. I can clean her voice up so she sounds like she's in the room. That was on an old cassette tape with the old whirling round sound. And yet now I've got her back so it's like AI Audrey 2023. Uh, the only thing I can't do is get my voice to sound like that. But a colleague said to me the other day, why don't you just get your voice um, from when you were that age? Because you've probably got tapes of yourself, haven't you? And I said, well, yeah, actually I do. So why don't you get that voice and type it into AI to recreate your own voice? And then you can get both of you sounding like you're in your own time, but in yeah. the modern age. So uh, that's yeah. A, that's incredible, isn't it? To that's a great, that must be a great project to, uh, yeah. to bring back, especially as it was so poignant as well. Yeah, it t totally. And it's so funny, these moments. I, 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 honestly, I've been so lucky in my career that I've had so many of these moments that, you know, it's hard to be able to say them all. But, you know, whether it's interviewing, particularly like uh, presidents and, you know, I had uh, um, an interview with the president of Brazil during that trip. And the TV production team told me to ask about the environment because obviously that's what the program was about. But I was a kid who wanted the truth. So what I actually asked him was, well, I'll take you back there. Basically, he was speaking in Portuguese, even though he could speak perfect English, because when we were greeted, he was saying hi, hello. But in the interview, and it was my first lesson of a politician using their language as a barrier to you asking a question because you have to wait for the answer back. Yeah. Which is that's enough clever, time yeah, that's, to uh... be able to think about it. But my question to him was, Mr. President, Amnesty International this week have revealed that sections of your police task force have been killing children on the streets of Brazil as part of a cleanup operation. Well, the look of horror on the BBC producer's face when I asked that question and the look around the room of what has he just asked the president. And President Fernando de Colo of Brazil looked at me and kind of sideswept the question. Didn't, I have to say, the handshake at the end as a 15 year old seemed a bit harder than I was expecting. <laughs> but I knew I'd ask the question. He didn't really give a good answer, but I'd ask the question and sometimes and I've learned this in my career, asking the right question is more important than getting the right answer. And the reason being is you're very unlikely to get the exact answer that you're looking for. But if you ask the right question, then the audience knows that you cared enough to ask the question that they were probably shouting at their TV screen radio. How the person answers is often a great example of who they really are yeah that's it's uh, it's quite interesting i don't think people appreciate that that skill so how did you progress from the print journalism into into the radio as you are today what was the journey there well i got to about uh 19 when the early times said to me i'm really sorry don but we've been faking your byline for about a year now, you're, you're, you're 19 and we've been saying you're 18. You can't really work for us anymore. We can't really send you on these because you're not really a child anymore. So you need to uh, basically stop. And I said, okay, which was funny because I loved all of that, you know, and I really enjoyed writing for the newspaper. Um, so at that sort of time around about 15, funnily enough, I just started really doing hospital radio and I went along to the Royal Victoria in Folkestone, and they had a hospital radio team there. And I started recording, going out, doing bits for them. And uh, they had a program called uh, Down Your Way, which was running all these cables all the way through the hospital on a closed wire with a pair of headphones and a microphone. And I watched the presenter, Steve, do it every week. And I loved being part of the idea of being part of that show. 
and I loved watching him present on the air and he was very good and um sorry there's amazing swans here there isn't they're beautiful aren't they and um I uh started doing that Tim so I just got the bug I think at that point and I then did com community radio I was a big player in the local community radio scene in Dover and Folkestone and this nightclub owner called Eddie was running loads of nightclub um, but he also was running uh, uh, radio stations community stations so I got involved there and then I did my own radio station in Dover called Coastline FM um, so it was all just really happening for me and I went to college in Maidstone first and then Dover and I think it was really in Dover when I was starting doing these community stations even more that I realised I really wanted to do it. I had a bit of work experience at uh, Invicta Radio, as it was then. Yeah. And they, funnily enough, got me to do Vox Pops in Dover about the Channel Tunnel opening, which a couple of years earlier I had done the breakthrough and all of that and the interviews with Michael Howard. So it was just starting to emerge that actually I liked storytelling, but I wasn't very good at it, I don't think, in terms of my voice tone and all of that. That came later, I guess, if it ever came. <laughs> and uh, and that became part of my world. That I was doing hospital radio for five years. I was station manager there. I was organising programmes. I was organising teams. I was running down to the hospital radio with an hour's notice when someone called in sick or said they couldn't come tonight. And I was on my bike and my dad said, you're not going down the hospital again. And I said, yeah, because someone's not doing their programme. And he went, oh, really? Can't you just give a night off of it? And I said, no, I've got to get there. I've got to do the programme for the patient. So that ethos of the listener being important really became part of my world, I think. Absolutely, yeah. And then you progressed effectively from, so you, you had a spot at Sky Radio or IRN for a while. Yeah, so I had this, uh, so I worked then in, uh, well, 1995, I got my first radio job, really, for a radio station called KFM, yep. which was part of Kent and Sussex Radio, an independent radio station. And it was run by a guy called Andy Gemmell-Smith, who was the boss of a mixing company called, uh, a mixing desk company called Alice Soundtech, who are really well known. And most of the studios in the 90s would have had one of these desks in their studio in the UK and abroad. So it was great to be part of the scene there because we were the very first station to use mini discs on air as commercials after the carts had ended. So the old cartridges you used to have with yep. tape on um, and reel to reel and all that had gone. So we were kind of revolutionary in that sense. All our music was all on mini discs. All our news was all on mini discs and no one else was using it because he had the big kind of contract, if you like, to do it and to test it all out. So. I worked there for five years. Now, if my wife and I, Tim, are going through this kissing gate here, there's an insistence that we do. So I don't know if you, because I feel a bit weird just, no, I can't do it. <laughs> the look of panic there, the look of panic. Um, we've known each other a long time, too. I know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I worked there for five years and then around about 2000, there was this crossroads for me of, I was really friendly with the guys at um, Independent Radio News, which is the radio wing of ITN, still exists today. And Sky News Radio had just started up six months earlier. Um, and I had this kind of contrast between going to IRN. They invited me. The editor said, would you like to come work for us? But then I was also headhunted by Sky News Radio. And I had this choice of going either one. I, I decided to go to Sky. Um, and I was there for a very short time, really, if I'm honest, because, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a difficult period in my life and I wasn't probably ready for it. And I don't mind saying I had a, uh, a breakdown um, at that point uh, working at Sky. And um, I just didn't know what to do because my whole world since I was 12 was all to do with this world of broadcasting. And it kind of went a little bit wrong for me and um, I, you know, a few things happened at Sky that just meant that I felt like I couldn't work there anymore and I was getting up at silly o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, leaving Seven Oaks to get there for a six o'clock shift to Isleworth and it just wasn't working for me. I was only in my twenties really, so, you know, I just had to make a choice. But do you know what? Actually, that rebuilt my world and I had stuff that was going on behind the scenes in my own life 
that was really the cause of that as a kid growing up. So for me, that was a kind of moment, a real sort of taking stock moment. So I always think whenever I hear someone say, oh, I'm having a difficult time or I'm having a rough time in life, you know, you've got to really listen to those people because often even the people you think are completely on top of everything and look like nothing's going wrong in their world, often there always is something that we're all dealing with because we're all just humans, you know. I guess also, I mean, you, you look back on things where they went wrong and you, you, you probably think back now, well, if, it, if, it, if I'd stayed there, would, would I have had the opportunities I've got now? Yeah, and you know what? I, I wouldn't have met my wife, you know, and I wouldn't have probably came here yeah. to live on the Romney Marsh, which I absolutely love. So these things happen and sometimes I think you put so much pressure on yourself as a youngster to achieve that you forget to live. And I was definitely doing that, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. So it actually worked out really well for me because I then went freelance for, uh, well, it took me six months from the moment of actually having a proper full-on breakdown. And I mean, literally not being able to know whether I was coming or going and all the rest to then rebuilding myself to do freelance work as a reporter and working for local, local stations. And then went to work for Kent police as a press officer. And it was during that time, six months with them, that a brand new office was opening in Tunbridge Wells for the BBC. And I one day fired off an email to the boss of the TV and radio station and said, I want to get back into radio. I love what I'm doing with Kent Police, but I've got all this career beforehand since I was a kid. I would love to come and chat to someone. Went in there to the office, had an interview, and I've been there 22 years. That's amazing. And that was just the right point, was it? Because that, So that's when Radio Kent, because I think back then there wasn't much of a TV presence in Kent for the BBC, was it? It was we uh, had London, New, London Plus, wasn't it? We I had think? Newsroom South East that was based out of Elstree, yep. the Elstree, which covered Kent. And BBC Radio Kent was in Chatham, Sun Pier. So I worked two weeks in Chatham in the old radio hub there, which was lovely because it's a very nostalgic place for us all still. And then two weeks later of joining in 2001, in February of that year, we then moved over to Tunbridge Wells to this purpose-built, brand new, high-tech radio and television and online service, which was really thrilling for me. So in a way, all those little movements, all that experience, the, the, the highs, the lows, obviously meant to be, it was yeah. the right time. And I had a fantastic beginning of my time at the BBC, you know, working with some incredible people and lucky enough that even, you know, today I still work with great people and, you know, our one aim is to tell people about their own lives, that they themselves are the complete architect of, because it's their stories that we just cover. And you've certainly done your fair share of different shows over the years, so I used to wake up um, and look, watch breakfast TV, and then when it switched over to news from southeast for the bulletin, you'd have a segment at the end introducing your show when you were in the mornings. Yeah, well, I, I did mid morning for a year. Um, I did uh, the drive show for 16 years. Um, I recently been presenting an arts program that lasted five years um, and got new things to happen later this year with a new show, a daily show. So yeah, it's all very exciting. And the one thing about broadcasting is that for me, it's never been about where I am, it's what I'm doing. Yeah, I've never been worried about whether I was the presenter of a breakfast show or a drive show or an art show. I had such a great time doing the art show in the last five years through the pandemic, amazing. Um, it's about what are you doing? Whose story are you telling? Am I still the kid who was able to ask the question of Audrey, not knowing who she was, and still ask the question that I think is important? Yes, I am. And I treat every day, Tim, like it's the first day I've ever walked into a broadcast environment. I, I'm a kid from Dover who feels so lucky that people have given me a shot at something I love doing. I'm never, you know, I don't, it's really weird in this industry because I don't know how interesting this is to other people, but there is a real sense that sometimes because you on the outside seem to be good at what you do or successful at what you do or whatever, that you yourself don't think about how lucky you are. Yeah. And I know 
pretty much all my colleagues who I, you know, have a lot of time for will feel the same. There's this imposter syndrome that happens across the industry and it happens across the arts, actually, whether it's an actor I speak to, the amount of actors who have used me as their therapy uh, partner <laughs> after we've done an interview to basically say, cool, this is uh, a weird environment, isn't it? Because you put yourself up against live, whether it be on a stage or on a radio, and, you know, this is a lovely doggy come to see us. Hello. <laughs> well, hello. I've never, never had a dog come along before. That's... Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hiya. Hi, yeah. Sorry, the record's not there yet. No, it's all right. That's the same with me. Um, no, I very much um, uh, pick up on that because I was talking to one of your guests a couple of weeks ago and it was basically described to me that going on press, TV, radio, you meet lots of people very occasionally and it's um, you do an interview and move on, but they have a very different experience with you, a very personal experience. And I can see that when you, you've had other guests back. Um, you've had certainly during the pandemic you had a lot of guests that you were hosting virtually as well yeah and i think also to blow your trumpet for you is you are an innovator so during the pandemic everyone was forced to work from home you found different ways to do your show and keep that kind of uh, keep everyone you know focused and entertained because it's uh you know it's keeping the radio show alive but you were doing a lot of uh video and social yeah with the, with the bbc as well i think i just if i'm honest i just like to learn I'm a, you know, if you give me a YouTube video, I'll learn what they're saying and then do it. You know, if you tell me that something can't be done, I'll try and find a way of making that happen. And I don't know where that comes from. Um, my dad was a very manual kind of guy, you know, working as a, a, a seaman. And I think maybe his way of talking about the sea being a cruel master if you like you know having to deal with going through the panama canal and and going through cape horn and things like that and having to navigate these massive ships that he was part of when he was in the merchant navy and then all the years when he was out of dover i was very proud or i am very proud of him um and i think he installed in me this sense of adventure so you know i've always had that kind of and it comes with tech as well. I know you asked about tech, but the whole thing about embracing something new that I haven't seen before. I mean, you and I are terrible because you've bankrupted me with some of the things you've made me buy. You've done the same. Okay. <laughs> we've bankrupted each other. We have. And now we're both getting divorced. <laughs> we both, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> but the That's point, not true. <laughs> it's not true, yeah. Uh, but the point is, um, you know, we... we we both had that love of technology and, and I, I, is it working now, Tim? Yeah, I think it is. See, the thing is, why on earth did we bring up technology? I know. And then look what's happened. It's like, if you talk about technology, the thing's going to go wrong. Yeah. It's like, you just never talk about technology. You never say, how do you get on with technology? Cause it will go off. Yeah. I can't believe it. The bizarre thing is so we've stopped recording uh, as we were walking along and it's never done that before. So I don't know if it's the hot day or the literal long journey we've done from where the car's parked. I mean, oh, yeah, it's a long way. It's a long way, we'll yeah. Turn we, shall we turn around? Yeah, yeah. Walk back that. Let's, let's get it. Anton Deck style, that's it. Oh, yeah, there yeah. we go. So this has never been done before. We're, <laughs> we're turning around and walking back. Um, so, yes, we were talking about technology and innovation. I guess the other thing I'm thinking about is um, I'm very, I've always been very passionate about local news, radio, TV. You mentioned Invicta Radio earlier. That was quite a pioneer here in Kent. Yeah. Some of the presenters on it have gone on to do national radio. I believe the guy that started Sky News started it in Victor Radio. Um, but those days are gone of those big independent. And even in terms of the BBC now, I mean, Radio Kent was almost like an independent radio station back in the 80s. With It had the word BBC on it. But they all had their own logos. They had their own identities. The old host house. Th that's it. And nowadays, it's uh, you've got lots of overlap with uh, stations close like Essex or... Um... Okay, so here's the thing, Tim. In the same way we talk about technology and innovation, I've always been a great believer that, you know, nothing ever stays the same. And I think we, as human beings, have this natural, completely understandable instinct to want everything to be the way it was when we first got married, when we first, you know, got our first TV, 
you know, we are nostalgic for the moment that is linked to the time where we had experiences. So what actually happens, and maybe someone would li listen to this and say, that's not how I feel, but I think that what happens is we find it very difficult to not have the things the same, but nothing can stay the same. No. And we only grow and we only move forward if things change. Um, and yes, you know, you're talking about something happening at the moment where the BBC is doing massive changes to local radio and it is a different thing and it is going to be slightly different to how people hear it. But I worked in commercial radio when that changed from a kind of 1980s heyday yeah. into the 90s where it was a very different. Yet you're talking about something now, which was in the 90s, but in the 80s, people would say, oh, it's all very different now. Yeah. So I think it's evolution. Sometimes things don't go quite well and maybe they make a mistake, but most of the time it's about keep going forward. And I think there's a danger that we, we, we believe that people are not adaptable enough to embrace change. I mean, how much do you physically love the fact that you're driving a very cool modern car and the fact that we're recording this on this most amazing camera that you and I would not have been able to see in our, you know, lifetime. Yeah. We're talking on the very same day that Google is 25 years old today. Right, I didn't know that. you and I will both have remembrances of going to Cheriton Library or the Grace Hill Library in Folkestone and using microfiche to find an article which we then had to zoom in on. Yeah. And yet I can get that in my back pocket now and find out instantly a question to why did Tim's camera stop in the middle of our recording? And because we spoke about technology, that's why, uh, because that was something else. I so, think AI you know, detected we needed to go to the pub after this and <laughs> has turned us around. I think that's what ha happened. Yeah, I think you're right. right. No, so, so, so I think change is hard and I think we all have, you know, difficulties changing. You know, I've had so many changes in my life that, you know, hasn't always been easy, hasn't always been rosy. Um, but you have to try and put one foot in front of the other, I think. And in the modern age of broadcasting, people are just not experiencing it in the same way. People are watching it differently. You know, people are watching it when they want on demand. They're not watching it to a TV schedule anymore. So all of those things are different. And I think that's really what's happening with Radio 2. It's just changing to a different way of how the consumer is reacting. Yeah. Yeah, so this year's been quite an upheaval on the national front. I mean, and as you said, with the BBC locally as well. And what's, what, that, that's, that's not just in radio, is it? There's been a, quite a bit of restructuring in BBC News as well. There's been changes of, you know, the way they do the split between world news and UK news, I believe, as well. But also, Tim, you work at Sky. You know, there, there have been changes there. Your, your, your breakfast presenter is just changing. You know, things happen. Yeah. You, you know, things happen to embrace different reasons, different technologies, different ways of the consumer taking on board. I think the only, you know, I'm not here to talk on behalf of the BBC. I just work there. Yeah. But I'm passionate about what we do. And I think the reality is that with all, all organisations, there's only so much that you have in terms of finances to make things work. And I often think that an organization like mine, which I love, and like every organization has its ups and downs, has its flaws, has its difficulties. The bigger the organization, the more likely that is. But the reality is that because I think we love the idea, some people might not, but I think if they really ask themselves, do they like the idea of Auntie, the BBC? I think they take to see it completely disappear. And I think because of that, we're also the target often of a lot of people on the other sides wanting to capitalize on that. Um, but as I say, you know, the kid in me who was 15 couldn't have been more impressed by going to New York, looked after by an amazing team of BBC people, a producer, Andrea, I remember her name, you know, um, a fantastic sound guy who I see over the years was mentioned, you know, on on TV, seeing his name come up on credits to things. Yeah, it's it's those 
moments that I had as a kid that made me want to be part of the organisation that I'm still part of now. And you must be super thrilled now because the way you can you capture uh, radio, the way that you can broadcast from anywhere, the way if I'm if I move from Kent, I can still listen to you anywhere in the world through BBC Sounds. That must be incredible. Yeah, I think that I think I think the 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 change of and it actually happened when we first went on to the internet as BBC. I was obviously there at Radio Kent when that happened before BBC Sounds came along. And it was phenomenal because I had a guy called Roy in Danbury, Connecticut, who made contact with me. And at the time, emails were really only starting to be a big thing. So I had the Dominic King Emailers Club and I had Roy and other people in America linking into my show on BBC Radio Kent and having this kind of club idea of all the people in Kent who were on emails, sending in their emails and on a daily basis, we would talk about what they'd written in. That today seems like water coming out of a tap. It's normal. Yeah. But back then it was something very different, very special. And even to film ourselves while being on the air was a complete, wow, you're filming yourself while being on the radio. So I think technology, going back to what you said about, you know, the, the changes of technology, it can be embraced. AI can be embraced, but it also has to just be guarded against that it isn't changing the whole dynamic of what makes people want to hear another human voice. I think that's the key thing. And I think that time will tell what happens in the future with broadcasting across the spectrum what happens with when linear broadcasting kind of disappears, I guess. Yeah. And that sense of going to my back pocket and listening to whatever I want to anywhere in the entire planet Earth yeah. when I want is what is interesting to see. And I would say just because someone is the other side of the world doesn't mean you can't have as close a relationship as someone who lives in the town next to me. Yeah. It's all about how you yourself broadcast and how the person receives you as a broadcaster to them in their homes. So I guess a, a closing question, um, considering the journey you've, we both come, come through the analog world into the digital world and the changing trends of viewing and listening to content, where do you see yourself at the, when you're ready to hang your headphones up, where will the industry be, do you think? I think that one thing I'm really excited about at the moment is virtual reality. Um, potentially mixed reality as well, but I think virtual reality is right now the kind of new ground where when people are able to put the headset on and mask and be able to transport themselves into worlds which as broadcasters we could really start to create and i'm going to tell you something i haven't said to anyone we need the kissing gate again as well we are near the kissing gate <laughs> we are near the kissing gate i'm, I'm nervous i'm nervous <laughs> <laughs> um well let's consider this kissing gate like going into the future together yeah. right so you go first okay i feel you should go into the future first all right but, i'll but go i'll go we'll, we'll get the camera going with you so this is where we are, yeah. which is great, but this is the future. Oh, guess what? It feels the same. Uh, yes. Because that's the point. It feels the same. And I think that, you know, when technology happens, it's a state of mind that you yourself feel how you feel, which is why we're nostalgic for things that have happened in the past. But I think VR, which I'm really excited about being part of, and I said to you something I haven't sort of talked about, as we speak, I'm having a studio built by um, some friends in VR so that I can have a conversation as my Dominic King avatar with the avatars of other people in that virtual world and use the studio in the same way I'd use the studio in the real world, which is to sit behind a desk, to have a microphone. You may ask yourself, well, why? Why not? I just, I think that's really cool. I, that, I, cause it, cause you, you can transpose yourself into different worlds instantly, can't you? Different interests. I mean, I think you mentioned there's comedy going, happening in the virtual world now. There's a, there's a guy, um, Kyle, who, uh, 
he he's um, known as Failed to Render, which I think is one of the best names ever in the um, VR world. Failed to Render is his name. You check him out. And he, during the pandemic, basically as a comedian, um, realized that all his gigs had gone down the pan. He wasn't able to bring people together. So he turned them into a virtual reality uh, nightclub and comedy night. And he's still doing it today. Every week, he has comedy nights two or three times a week. And people go in from the virtual headset and they sit in his club. I have physically gone into the club in San Francisco that he runs via my home here on the Romney Marsh and been in the space where he does his comedy nights. And it has become a really big thing. And it just strikes me that we're always wondering where the next big thing is. The next big thing, as you know, in the world you work in, Tim, often can take a decade to, to actually become the next big thing. Yeah. So VR, you'll read loads of stuff about it where they're saying, oh, it's not really going anywhere. This is not really happening. Zuckerberg's not doing this or that. You know, Apple coming in with a Vision Pro, all these things. But the reality is I've only been in it three months and I've learned so much in three months because that brain of mine that loves to learn new things has already taught myself how to be part of a, a, another world. And, and when I sat there with some young guys who basically said, what do you want to build? And I started being the architect with them of my new studio in the VR world. And I'm physically watching them create blocks that become desks, that become studios. Or well, I said to them the words, I want the other studio to look like Abbey Road. And they suddenly put in a, uh, uh, a carpet, that kind of music studio, red carpet that you know that all the bands would be standing on to deaden the sound. And it's just amazing. So the future is whatever we want it to be. And I'm a great believer that we should try as much as possible to embrace change, embrace potential, because there was a time when people would have said most of the stuff we now take as a commonplace thing every day would not be possible and none of us would be excited about it. Yet we are, we do things, not always great, but giving it a try is good, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think uh, our next interview may well be in VR space. Yeah. I think you just need to work on having some legs though, because that is one thing I noticed with avatars in, in, in meta worlds. You don't have any legs at the moment, do you? So that's No, uh... no, they don't, they don't seem to want to give anyone any legs, but, um, I think there's something kind of quirky about that. That's, yeah. Uh, pretty groovy. Yeah. It, it, there's something about floating around with you, with, with just you. I don't know. It's, um, it's strange, but you know, we're walking on this beautiful day in September, walking down this lovely canal, the Royal Military Canal to our left, going all the way through, going past Port Lim Wild Animal Park and this just brilliant landscape. And this for me is how I escape the other world where I can just be here and enjoy this actual world as opposed to a virtual world or a digital world or, you know, and of course, these are recorded so that they are in 360. So you can relive that walk we've done today. You can literally walk around, look at the canal, look at Dom, see the sun behind you, see the pub ahead of you. Yeah, amazing. So when I said about the swans, you'll be able to go back and see and, the swans. And go back and see it, exactly, yes. <laughs> so Dom, thank you very much. It's been uh, really exciting. I know I do want to meet next in the virtual world. So I'm going to look forward to that very much. You have a fantastic rest of the summer. Thank you, Tim. It's been great talking to you. And... Uh, 360 Timmy, which is your new vehicle, is bringing so many people such a lot of joy by hearing people's stories of their lives. And I'm looking forward to the day when we talk more about you because you are an incredible, creative uh, innovator. I know you want this to end, Tim. I can see your director brain saying, <laughs> stop now, stop now. But who does not love a 360 Timmy shirt? That's all I'm saying. Exactly. Long may they continue. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye.